Okay, hello everybody to our macroeconomics course. Two days ago, yeah, we were dealing with maybe the main and the most important indicator if we talking about economic growth, um, economic prosperity of a country and for this we talked about the grow domestic product which is the indicator when we are calculating economic growth then this is the parameter which we have to look at. So I really want that you keep in mind this definition grow domestic product is the total market value of finished good so all intermediate goods we are subtracting from the production point of our economy within the country's borders so roughly speaking we just put a fence around our country and in a specific time so today I will come to the numbers especially for Germany that the German GDP is almost 4 billion euros and if not further specified then this number means this is the total market value of all goods and services for the um, finalized uh, use within the year 2022 but of course I also mentioned that we have this um, numbers quite often also for quarterly data well in order to summarize um, we can of course criticize this concept in order that it is too much market based and it does not reflect uh, yeah let's say qualitative indicators especially at this point here what means all that um, at that point we of course can criticize this concept but actually yeah if we then want to feed in other categories in order to uh, measure prosperity of our country then of course yeah do you have always to judge somehow to give maybe I talked about this uh, the educational system or the health system in your country or the what is the situation of the infrastructure you have to give them weights and then you are going in this difference between positive and normative um, <coughs> uh, things um, and for this if we think that we are here in social science so what is the task the task is that we yeah give the society parameters give a good description give good theories and then afterwards the society is hopefully within some democratic structure uh, is deciding what really to do and um, then this is of course then a normative process where we can then judge is it enough only to look at economic growth via GDP and of course then we feed in in our political process also other categories um, but at first the social science has the task to give more or less the framework for what we are what we can decide in our society and since you are studying economics or international business uh, studies for this I think everybody should know at least yeah some numbers 
that we then can more or less judge if we hear economic growth of Germany this year will be maybe minus 0.5 percent. What is the meaning of this? Uh, what uh, is the meaning of um, the private consumption has an amount of 2 billion euros that we more or less yeah, know at least somehow the size of these numbers. And for this, I give you the explicit numbers for Germany of um, GDP especially. And for the calculation of GDP, we ended um, on Tuesday that in order to obtain the number for GDP, we can use yeah, three concepts. And since, remember, total market value, then it, it is not no surprise that we use the so-called production approach. And what is this? This is more or less the supply side of our market. Every goods and services which we are producing. And if we look on the one hand in our classical market diagram on the supply side, well, equilibrium is then the match of demand and supply. So, of course, then we can also calculate this number from the other side, from the demand side. And this is for which goods and services we um, take our income and for which goods and services we are using our income. And this is the so-called expenditure approach. There we are looking at the private consumption, at investment, at government expenditure, so to speak, government consumptions. And of course, if you um, remember the circle of law, we are not alone in the world so we are selling products abroad and we are buying products from abroad. And for this, we also look at the net exports. Well, we talk here about net exports we, when we have this German view, because Germany is one of the yeah, largest exporters in the world. Right now, the second largest after China. So this is then the demand side. And the third possibility is the so-called income approach. If we look at the production process, then we can say production is nothing else than transforming inputs into output. And this output is are our final goods which we are buying and in this production process, we mainly, if we take the macroeconomic view, we think of one aggregated um, input factor as capital and the other important input factor is aggregated labor. So do we divide then the income in our GDP, how much is earned via the capital. This is then our income, which comes from uh, profits. And what is the part which we find for labor? And this is then just our wage income. And in the following, we want to look at how much is it, especially in Germany. OK, so as I already told you, here in the center, GDP in Germany, and this you can maybe remember, is in the actual situation roughly almost 4 billion euros. 
And then we go to the supply side, the production approach. And then of course, at first we look at all goods and services which we are producing. But in total production, there we find, of course, also all intermediate goods. And for this, we see here for Germany, this is roughly 7.5 um, billion, uh, no, no trillion we are here in German, in, in the English curse, sorry. So this is then 7.5 trillion euros <laughs> and well if we look then at the number of intermediate goods then we really see how much our production process is divided in many many sub processes because here you see roughly four trillion euros, so intermediate goods and services are roughly half of total production. Well, and then we uh, are not um, directly at, um, oh, this is in German, this has to be canceled out, this is grow value added. change. Um, then we end up not directly at GDP because we have we are also the connection um, between the government and the um, sector of enterprises and households when you remember the uh, circular flow. And there we had these flows of taxes and subsidies and there we just take the difference between taxes and subsidies and after this influence of the government, we end up then by the grow domestic product. And this is then roughly this 4 billion, uh, 4 trillion euros. Well, if we go then to the expenditure approach, the demand side, Then we see here, this is a little bit more than 50% is due to private consumption in Germany. This is also a number you can roughly keep in mind. And then also that investment and um, government consumption is also roughly the same, um, almost around 900 billion euros. So this should be also here that every number is in billion euros. And then you see net exports in Germany are roughly 100 billion euros. And in general, in Germany, we can say that during most times uh, we are a net exporter. Well, then if we step at last to the income approach, uh, approach. Then we have here our wage income. So the compensation for employees, if we are not owning the company itself, if we are working for some company. And here we see that this is roughly divided by one third to two thirds. 
this you can also keep in mind. But if we take profit income and wage income together, then you should also know that we then also not directly add the GDP, but that we end up then at the so-called national income. And if you look at the media, then we can say that you quite often find that national income, grow domestic product or grow value added are used more or less as synonyms. But since you are studying economics, then I think you should at least know that these are different numbers. And for this, I just give you here this table. Then we have also to um, calculate further the difference between taxes on production and imports minus all subsidies. This is something quite similar to this calculation here. And then we come to the net national income. And this I think you have already heard in other lectures. If you look at a single company, at a single enterprise, especially if this is a company from some uh, with um, some uh, real goods in some um, industrial production. Then you have a lots of machines within your production process. And then, then one really um, yeah, important number is the depreciation on your machines. And if we look at the total economy in Germany, then, of course, it is uh, not very surprising that also the depreciation in Germany is very large here with roughly 800 and billion euros. And adding then this up, we obtain the grow national product. And here you should again remember the domestic concept and the national concept. So here we are looking at all people who are working in the country and domestic concept. We are looking geographically within a country what is put, produced. So having the grown national product, we then have also to recalculate this via the incomes from abroad minus the incomes which we are earning um, <coughs> from other countries. And then we ending up again in at uh, the grow national product. And look also at these arrows here. And this especially means that this minus sign is to be has to be calculated from down to the upper direction. And so we have to calculate 4 billion minus roughly 130 in order to end up here at the Crow National product. Mm -hmm. OK, and now I will uh, go in more detail to yeah, every possibility, every approach, the production approach, its expenditure and income approach. And we start again with the supply side. So everything what we calculate here in percentage is then relative to grow value added. And this you have also to keep in mind that it is not calculated relative to GDP, but to grow value added. And yeah, from a historical perspective, I already told you we started the circular flow with the agricultural sector. And 200, 300 years ago, this was the most important production sector in a country. 
and especially for Germany, a highly industrialized country, you see there is relative to total grow value added only 1% left. Um, well, maybe not the agricultural sector is changing, but what we are producing on these agricultural areas, this is um, right now a little bit changing in Germany. If you look at the energy sector, then in order to produce energy in Germany itself and not buying this from other countries, for this we um, want to increase our solar industry. Uh, so in our country, energy coming from solar panels or energy coming from um, wind energy. And for this, of course, we need uh, very large areas. And there we have also somehow a kind of transformation that uh, we change the areas from using for the agri for um, producing food for the agriculture sector in order to put windmills on this or solar panels and so on. And um, yeah, there we will see if how much this will change our country here in Germany. And this will more or less be a change for almost all developed countries. Yeah, but what else are the ma main producing sectors here? And there we have then in Germany manufacturing and production in the year 2022. We have these 23%. Well, if you think of roughly, and then I think you can um, more easily remember this, we can say that roughly one fourth of our grow value added is in Germany still manufacturing and production. If we take the construction sector, this is then maybe roughly 5% in the actual situation. 16 and wholesale, retail, transport, economation, food service activities, and so on. This is maybe then roughly 15%. And then it's the private and public services are left. And here you see this is the largest one with more than 50% um, in the actual situation, 52%. If we take it all only with this number, then you end up here maybe with roughly 55. So if you remember the definite numbers of 2022, it's okay, but you can also take just 55, 25. 5 and 15 um, percent. So these are some numbers I want you to have in mind. But what I especially think is always uh, very interesting is where do we come from? And if we look here in a time period at a time period of roughly 50 years, then we here see the more or less yeah, dramatic change of our societies. Mm -hmm. So if we go back 50 years, then we start at 40% of the manufacturing and production sector. And this was the largest part in our country, while classical services were only one third or roughly 30%. So here, we see over time until the start of the millennium, more or less, then we have a period where these uh, parts are more or less constant. So this is period of change to a service oriented. economy. 
well, again, let's just put it here, roughly 55, and maybe 25, 15, 5, and anecdotally, the 1% for the agricultural sector. Well, actually, if we take these 25% of grow value added of the manufacturing and production sector, this is for a developed country a really high value. So, again, international context, this number is compared to other developed countries very high. So if we compare Germany, for example, yeah, then we should use other comparable or yeah, comparable countries. So let's take Great Britain, uh, France, um, or Italy, which are yeah, almost as large as Germany and um, are also situated in Europe. So most of the framework is the same. And we look there for the part of manufacturing and production sector. Then we find their numbers less than 20% or even less. Mm -hmm than 15%. Well, and what you also have to keep in mind is that, yeah, these numbers are only a description. So from this, we cannot say that this is good or bad. And yeah, in order to explain this, if we take this compared in the international context, very high number. This number is then during um, the last 20 years very differently uh, interpreted. So if we take, for example, this period here. So this kink is the financial crisis. So in the start of the millennium, what was the uh, situation there in Germany? So in Germany, there we had yeah, a phase um, yeah, of economic downturn or many, many difficulties, especially in the labor market. Unemployed people, the number of unemployed people during these times rose up, up to f um, 5 million people. And this was also then the re uh, reason why uh, the government changed in 2006 in Germany, more or less. This was a change from Schröder to Merkel. Well, and then it was interpreted what is wrong in Germany. And the explanation then, or one explanation was, well, let's compare Germany especially with Great Britain or other smaller prospering countries. Um, and there during this time, there was huge, uh, huge um, economic growth, especially in Ireland. We were talking about Ireland as the Irish tiger uh, economically. And then we looked there at the production uh, structure and there we saw, well, they had the part of uh, the services was much higher, especially the part of the financial services. And then it was interpreted, well, you in Germany, you have your old industry and this is uh, not what you should do in the future. And um, Great Britain is more or less the benchmark. And during this time, Great Britain especially had much higher um, uh, growth rates. Or during this time was also Spain very prospering in the start of um, the millennium. 
and this especially was due to the construction sector here mm -hmm. in Spain in the start of the millenn millennium many many things were built streets houses infrastructure and so on mm -hmm. and from this the country was very prospering and the construction sector in um, Spain was about 20-25% uh, of growth value added. Well, and all this, the service, especially financial services in Germany was about 4%, in Great Britain it was almost 10%. Mm -hmm. Well, and what happened then? Well, the financial crisis happened. Mm -hmm. And well, of course, uh, Germany was also hit very hard by the financial crisis. But then, in the aftermath, 2010 and 2011, the uh, development of Germany after the financial crisis was really, really fast. So we were very fast back on track. <laughs> and what was then the explanation why Germany performed much better than other countries, especially Great Britain. The explanation was then, well, we have this block of roughly one fourth of manufacturing and production. And this is <coughs> much less um, volatile than these financial services, which they developed in Great Britain and um, especially also the demand for industrial pr products came very fast back from emerging markets from india from china from brazil um, after the financial crisis and so this helped really germany to come back so in let's say the year 2000 this number was interpreted to be uh, um, the wrong strategy after the financial crisis it was the explanation well this is the reason of the good performance of germany and also that our construction construction sector compared for example with spain was not so large so we had no um, really um, large problem because of the downturn in the construction sector and this was a worldwide problem. And yeah, and if we look now at the actual situation, we have still this 25% and the economic performance of Germany right now is not very good. Relative also to other Euro European countries. Well, and again, the interpretation is, well, you have your old industrial companies and especially um, if we look at the trend of digitalization then we say well we are too slow in the transformation in the digital transformation in Germany and so this is the reason why we are not performing that good and though you should really keep in mind that if you look at these numbers you have always to look at the whole situation at which is your country um, right now and then start interpreting is it good or not so good and um, but the description uh, good descriptions should always the starting point okay this for the supply side the production approach. Let's step to the expenditure approach. Most numbers we already have seen in this table here, but I also want to go a little bit more in more detail in this um, investment part. But oh, let's put down also here roughly. So we could say private consumption would be roughly 55% investments in total, 
maybe roughly 20% and government consumption also roughly 20% this will be both uh, roughly 900 billion euros and external contribution exports minus imports roughly 100 billion euros which would be then around 5%. Um, what I want you to have a look at is especially here at this number on in the change of inventories. And, oops, this shouldn't be here. Sorry. That we have here a number almost uh, 100 um, billion euros. So let's say it's roughly 80 uh, billion euros. And if we take this uh, relative to GDP, so let's say here roughly 80, and we have GDP roughly for trillion euros. So how much percent is then these 80 out of 4 trillion euros? What is the relative number? So 80 billion euros over four trillion euros. This is roughly what in percent? Yep, two, yes. So what you have to calculate is four over 4,000 is then 2%. Well, and if you Remember the circular flow, there we talked about unplanned investments. So this change in inventory is nothing else than these unplanned investments. So compare with unplanned investments of the circular flow. Well, and if you make the thought experiment, nothing else changes, only the inventories. Then we would have just in the actual situation a change of GDP because of the change in inventories of 2%. So we would have a growth rate just only because of change of inventories of 2%. Well, and maybe you already know that, especially for developed countries, 1 or 2%, it's quite okay for a growth rate then it could be the case that a really large part of your economic growth comes more or less from this number of change of inventories. Mm -hmm. And as I showed you uh, in the beginning of the lecture, I'm doing with my colleagues um, a forecast on GDP every three months. So we have to admit that, yeah, this number is very hard to get really because then we should we, 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 we would have to ask every company in Germany how are your inventories are changing mm -hmm. and uh, so we have only a rough estimation from statistics for this number 
And uh, so more or less, this is some kind of residuum. You are calculating everything else. And then you make your own estimation on the change of inventories. And with this residuum, then you more or less can put the growth rate at that number, which you with a smile want to have. So think of um, you end up with all calculation without inventories by 0.8. <laughs> but in your statement, you want uh, to um, say that um, the economy is growing with more than 1%. Well, then just put 0.3 or 0.4% in the inventories. And for this, um, if you read forecasts uh, for economic growth of countries, you should always have also in the table then a look what is the part of growth of the change of inventories. And um, also sometimes uh, some institutes doesn't give you the number. And this, um, yeah, I think is not a good way to do it because then sometimes you add up all other parts and then you find, well, a significant part has to come in your calculation from the inventories. So this is then also yeah, quite important to interpret the number of economic growth and especially in very volatile times. So in the Corona crisis, in the financial crisis, there we had really huge changes in the um, inventory position. And also right now it is a, a quite high number. So, but let's have also a look um, for this number um, in the longer time horizon. Here we see that, yeah, the parts are more or less constant. So again, this is maybe 55. This is maybe both roughly 20% and this one maybe our 5%. Uh, but you see here also in this 50-year um, perspective for Germany that um, the external contribution was almost always positive so that we have exported more. Um, but we have here a period where exports and imports more or less balanced. And if you look at this time period, uh, do you have an explanation or, or do you think of an explanation why we have here exports and imports balanced? During this 10 years, roughly from 1990 to 2000. Was this a time where we didn't export or we exported much less than in other times? If you think at this situation, what was the time in Europe or even in the world historically? Yeah. Yes, of course. This about the collapse. of Soviet Union. And what was then the impact, the special impact for Germany? <laughs> yep. Yes, it was reunited. So this was the reunification. Well, and what does this reunification meant for our country? Well, we had this uh, new part, the former um, GDR coming to uh, Germany. And well, this was a country 
had a society structure of um, yeah, communist organ organization. And when we look then at the production possibilities we had in this part, then we had to admit that this was all not competitive on the world market. And so we really had a huge demand for capital to rebuild this new part of Germany. So, and this then blew up our imports. So still our exports were growing at a high rate, but we even increased the imports in a higher amount. So highly increased because of the capital demand to rebuild the former Well, and then ca we can say here in the start of the millennium, uh, what started in this time then with a very high speed, uh, what changed in the world, uh, especially so in the beginning of 2000s, maybe in the end of the 90s. <laughs> the internet, of course. This was, of course, one pushing factor, but there's also one other. Euro also, but this is then only uh, uh, for the perspective um, for, uh, for Europe, but what is, yeah, from a worldwide perspective also was highly important then. Maybe 20 years ago, we do not uh, really think about it. But during this time, we had not only the collapse of the Soviet Union, also China was yeah, a very less developed country, low, low developed country during this time. And what we can also say is, with the, in the end of the 90s, with the beginning of 2000, China really speeded up. So at this time here, um, China had maybe an GDP per head of yeah, some African country or so. And during more or less 10 years, it speeded that much up that now China is the second largest economy of the world. So, especially China stepped into the world market. Well, and also this, such a country, such an emerging country, large emerging country, what did they really need? They needed industrial products. They especially needed products from Germany in order to build an own industrial complex. And for this, we really um, yeah, participated in the growth, at the growth process of China China during this time. Okay, and at last we want to talk about the income approach, but this we want only to do in a very easy way. There we will only look at this split on profit income and wage income. And for this we calculate the so-called labor share. Then we uh, roughly um, calculate the compensation of employees 
So this is more or less our wage income. Calculating this relative to national income is then around our two third. I also always, I already uh, showed you. And if we take here the um, historical perspective, then we here can say it is roughly constant, volatile with plus minus five percent. So let's say two thirds plus minus five percentage points. And why is it fluctuating like this? Well, of course, we have profit incomes. And if you go to the capital markets, to the stock market, for example, there you have a much higher volatility inside it. And therefore, due to the change um, of the higher change of the capital markets, then also the labor share has, of course, also be volatile around this. Okay, so with this, we want to um, yeah, end up with our descriptive overview here at the example of, of Germany. And we now come um, yeah, to our general economic aims. And for this, um, we uh, can look at the so-called magic square. And for this, we look at four different aims in general. And of course, one aim would be economic growth. And there, the general aim would be steady and appropriate economic growth. Then another one, um, which is all, uh, right now, highly discussed is what is are the central banks do, uh, doing against um, inflation and why they are rising interest rates well their aim is especially price level stability and well there is maybe some trade off between these two aims because in a situation where the economy is quite prosperous then, of course, we would have also a situation with high inflation. But if we also want to have price stability, and later on we will talk about why this is um, a reasonable aim to have price, general price stability in a country, then, of course, interest rates have to rise in order to... Um, <coughs> in order to stop the high inflation process. Then, of course, one main or the most important yeah, influence for economic growth is the employment in situation in a country. And then the I would be maybe high level employment. But for this, you have also to be careful because you can create high level employment also with some government um, programs. And this we have done, uh, for example, during the Corona crisis and also during the financial crisis where we introduced um, the program of uh, of short term work. So we couldn't lay off the workers. But I think I know I have seen it. Um, but does this really then helps economic growth? I think not. So now I have to look because my internet connection, I told you, technical problems. <laughs> Crashed, unfortunately. Hopefully this will come back in a minute. And then start the meeting. So don't 
hear me, but now you should hear me again. Could you just give me a feedback that you hear me again? Because I left my, I lost my um, internet connection. Okay, so now we want to start with, oh, and then the fourth um, aim would be look at your um, connection to overseas. So to have a look on the external balance. What we want to start with is steady and appropriate economic growth. Well, I already told you this is measured with GDP, but with a special GDP, namely the so-called real GDP. Because think of the definition, total market value of all goods and services in a period in a country and of all finalized goods. So GDP would be then price times quantity. And then, of course, you could ho have also just economic growth by a rise of prices. But would we speak of prosperity in the economic way if just all prices have doubled and nothing else changed? I think not. And therefore, we want um, yeah, somehow to recalculate it that we do not have any more the price effect within our calculation. And this, in a minute, I will show you how it is done today. This is then called the real GDP. But GDP can also rise um, from another parameter. And right now we have it in Germany or also in, in Europe. If more people come in into a country, then they are eating, they need a flat, they need every goods. So they are buying goods from the expenditure approach perspective. And this also would then mean that you have just because you are more people in your country, you have economic growth. Would you again say that now I have a highly prospering country? Maybe not. And therefore, sometimes we then calculate also real GDP per head or per capita. Mm -hmm. And um, for a comparison, I also showed you here the development of population in the United States, Germany and France. And what you see here is that in Germany, without the impact of the refugees, Syria and Ukraine, more or less our population was constant around 180. 81 or 82 million people, while we have a steady growth in France and the even higher growth we had in the United States. So if we compare here the growth rates of the population, then you see here, especially until this kink here of the refugees from Syria in 2015 and 16, in Germany, we had almost no growth in population, while we had significant growth of 0.5 or 1% in United States and in France. And this we also have to know when we then compare the growth numbers of France and Germany or United States, which have almost always higher economic growth numbers than Germany, but a significant part is just because of <clears throat> the population growth there. Okay, but now we want to talk about how to come to this real GDP. So nominal GDP as we defined it, total market value, this can have yeah, two possibilities for the change. The one is that just only prices are changing and the other one would be that the quantities are changing. Well, but these 
price change. We will not interpret as yeah, economic prosperity. And for this, we want to try to cancel this price effect in order to have only this quantity effect. And when we are talking about economic growth, if not further specified, then we always mean only this real growth rate. Because, yeah, just think of all prices are doubling. That then really changes in your prosperous situation. Well, and how do we do it today? Well, we could calculate this with just keeping all prices constant. This was quite a long time be done. But uh, think of if we take the prices 10 years ago as our price basis. Then, of course, because of uh, yeah, many innovations, we have now new goods. And then there are many prices we don't have 10 years ago. Or if you look at this device here and compare this device, what was this device 10 years ago? So this is also not the same product anymore. So product itself change in quality. And for this, um, yeah, roughly 15 years ago, we um, changed our approach in order to calculate real GDP is that for every single year, we calculate for real GDP the quantities we produced in our actual year with the prices of the former year. So we step only one period back. And then we changed, we chained this process in order that we here quantities of today times prices yesterday relative this is just the nominal GDP of the last year times the former index. And this gives us then the index of the next year. We will do it um, in a minute uh, with an example because this seems uh, highly uh, theoretical. And what you also then do is um, we set one index one year at 100. And this is generally done if you uh, take some indices. Uh, uh, mostly you uh, put this index roughly around 100. And for this, we change this reference point also every five years um, um, into the future. So right now we are calculating all um, uh, we are calculating the index with um, 2015 is 100, but I think this year or next year, then we will change the basis to 2020. But the nice uh, thing here is that then the growth rates are not changing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Actually, we are not interested in the real number itself. What counts is the growth rate. And this is, of course, calculated relatively. And therefore, it is no matter which point you set at 100. And this we will all see just in a minute. And yeah, you have to be careful if you look at uh, some textbooks because um, the price concept with the fixed price basis. So valuing every year with the same price basis, you find this fixed price basis concept in some textbooks, um, but this is actually not right anymore. We calculate it via this chain index. So this is 
the chain index. So, and when we have this index, how do we obtain then the growth rate? Well, just taking the value today, minus the value yesterday, divided by the value yesterday. And this is always the same when you are calculating growth rates. If you are calculating growth of revenue, um, calculating growth of profits or anything else. Well, of course, if we have then these real growth, we are also interested in um, yeah the part of the nominal growth, which is due to only the price effect. And for this, we can just calculate the relative number of nominal GDP over real GDP. And this is then something like a whole wholesale price index we have. So this would be then this so-called oh, GDP. Mm -hmm. GDP deflator, and this is then a price index for the whole economy. And then, of course, we also can calculate the change of these GDP deflator. And this would be then the part of our change of uh, nominal GDP, which is only due to our price development. OK, and in order to explain this, hopefully, um, yeah, a bit further, we will just do some calculation where we have to apply all our definitions. Okay, so and I will do this also in Excel with you because I want you to start to use it, but I'll also write it all down at the in my um, PowerPoint slides. So let's think of a really simple economy with two goods, M1 and M2. This should be the quantities of our goods in the years 2016 to 2019, and this should be just the price development. So, and what we want uh, to start is just calculating nominal GDP. So what is nominal GDP in the year 2016? We have two goods which were produced and we have the prices what I have to calculate then. Any idea? Yes, and to sum up then, huh? so 0 0.9 times 100 plus 2 times 200. So this I will do here equals 0.9 times 100 plus 2 times 200. And this should be then hopefully 490. Well, and if I done it for the year 2016, I have already this formula. And this I have to do for all years. So I can just copy this and put this down. And then I've done all. 
calculations. So 490, 610, 697. 490, 510, no, 20, 610, and 51970. So let's write down it for <coughs> one example, 0 0.9 times 100 plus 2 times 200 equals 490. Well, if I have this, how do I obtain the index of GDP, of nominal GDP, if I start when I set 2016 to 100? So I know 490 should be 100. What is then 50? 520. If you identify 490 is 100, then 520 has, of course, some number larger than 100. But what do I have to do? Definitely right. So 520 over 490 times 100. Or in order to explain it to everybody, 520 relative to, five, um, to um, 490 has to be the same as the number we are looking for over 100 because 520 over 490 has to be equal x over 100, and then you just solve for x. So this we will also calculate here. 520 over 490 times 100. Well, and then, of course, the other index values are calculated in the same way. One hundred six point one two, one hundred twenty four point four nine, and one hundred forty two. Four. This is one hundred and six point one two. So let's take this also. So in this case, we would have to calculate six hundred and ten over 520 times 106.2 equals 124. Point, uh, 9 was it? Uh, no, 4. Point 49. So, and now, what is nominal growth. In 2016, is it possible to calculate the growth rate? No, because we need 2015 and there we have no number. What would be the growth rate for 2017?
18. So what we now want to calculate is the growth rate in 2017. So what? Yes, and then this is almost done. And divided by, yes, divided by 100. So let's take this one, 106.12 minus 100 over 100. And this, well, this we can do in our head is 6.12%. But it's maybe only possible because we make it relative to 100. 6.12%. So equals 106 minus 100 over 100. Well, and then of course all other numbers are calculated in the same way put it down and we end up with 17.31 and 14.26 And let's put also this here. Five would be then one hundred twenty four point four nine minus one hundred six point one two over one hundred six. Point one two equals seventeen three one percent. Okay, and now but this we will do then next week is that we now have to apply our new formula for the real GDP. And this is then for you as a task, as a homework, that you then just use this definition, quantity today, and you have to multiply this with the prices of the former period in order to get real GDP. And then we take as a basis 2016 for 100. And from this, since we have this starting point here, we can step back in the definition of the index of real GDP via using the 100 then here in order to get the index for 2017, 18 and so on. <coughs> so maybe you can try it. Two, oops, where we are here. To calculate real GDP and then index growth rates but this we will do also next week together. Okay, done. Thank you very much for today. And we see on Tuesday again.